When I was in the call process that led me here a couple of years ago, I noticed something kind of interesting. And it was like there was two predominant modes for churches. They would be like, we're awesome. Everything's awesome. Come here, be awesome with us. Or it was, we're desperate for new people because we're afraid that we're going to die. So come here and help us be, bring people in so we don't have to be, so we can be awesome again, because otherwise we're going to die. And we just need new people to help us be what we used to be. And it was kind of weird, because in either of those attitudes are really healthy or biblical. You know, I had the luxury of being able to take time because I knew I wanted to move on, but I wasn't in a huge hurry. So I could look around for someplace that was a little bit healthier. And I tell you that story because often when we are talking about reaching out to people who don't know Jesus, often when we're talking about people who are not part of the fellowship or anything else, we do it from our perspective. And we say, these people need Jesus. And we don't think about what they need or what they're thinking. We don't look at it through their eyes. And that's what I want to explore today. You see, what we did from Easter, excuse me, from Christmas to Easter was we walked through the Gospel of Matthew, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the last thing that Jesus says in that account is go forth to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, making disciples. And what we've been doing ever since Easter is exploring what that means. And that's why it says, Paul, well, it had said earlier, uh, to the ends of the earth. And we're talking about Paul's mission here. Because what we see in the rest of the New Testament is these guys and gals figuring out what does it mean to be a Christian? How do we share things? And last week, Pastor Anna had a great message, and she was talking about how Peter goes to work out with these Gentiles and trying to figure out what does it mean for us as a Jewish person who's always been kosher, who always goes to the temple and everything else. What does it mean to talk to these strange Gentiles? And if you weren't here last week, I'd say go back and take a look at that message because she really hit a nerve in a good way. It has been just amazing hearing the responses that you guys have had. It's really been fascinating and encouraging what you all had to say in response to that message. And what this message is today, what this story that we just heard Becky read, is the flip side. It's these Gentiles, these people who have never heard of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, that God, and they're trying to figure out, what do we do with this? How do we make sense of all this? And so what's happening is Paul and Barnabas are traveling around the Mediterranean, and they're up in what today is modern-day Turkey, and they're in this city that's part of the, the Roman Empire. And they would have worshipped, they worshipped the Greek and Roman gods, they swore allegiance to the emperor, they did all the stuff that you would expect out of any town in the Roman Empire. And so Paul and Barnabas come and speak, and they start telling people about who Jesus is. They tell people about God. And Paul sees this guy who's paralyzed, and he says, you, stand up and walk. And the guy does. And everybody in town is like, oh, this is awesome. Oh, this is amazing. This is great. This is so cool. Is, you know, you got to hand it to him for that. And now what happens next I think is hilarious I wouldn't have thought it was hilarious if I was there, and Paul and Barnabas did not think it was hilarious. But what happened was, is they tried to fit it into the framework they knew. They tried to fit this event into what they understood. And they're like, oh, this miracle happened. These guys must be our gods come to earth. Barnabas, the tall guy who doesn't say much, must be Zeus, Paul, the short guy who says way too much, must be Hermes. And they're like, awesome, we're going to worship these guys as gods. And the priests of the temple of Zeus are like, 
The gods have come to earth? Awesome. And so they show up with a couple of bulls and they say, we are going to sacrifice these animals to you. We are going to worship you. We are going to kill these animals. And then we're going to have a party. And Paul and Barnabas are like, no. We are human beings, not gods. And they try and explain to them, yeah, we're just here from God. And God has sent you these things, and he, you, you need to understand these things, and here's what's going on. And I love that last line of what Becky just read, which is, even with all this, they still had trouble restraining them from making sacrifices. And it's fascinating. They're just trying to work this out. So what does this mean for us today? I share that with you because if we look around us, we see this constantly. I was reading the paper on, like, paper, because I'm old. And I know, I am so old, I actually read the Wall Street Journal on, like, dead trees, okay? We're, I know, some of you are like, I've never seen that in real life before, okay? And there was this really interesting article in Monday's paper, An Early Surge of Faith Among the Young. And this was from Monday's Wall Street Journal. And I just want to read you a couple of things. This opening paragraph, a greater share of young adults say they believe in a higher power or in God. About a third of 18 to 25-year-olds say they believe more than they doubt the existence of a higher power, according to a recent survey of young adults. The findings, based on December polling, are part of an annual report on the state of religion and youth from the Springtide Research Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And then there's this really interesting quote from Abigail Visco Russert, Associate Dean of Princeton Theological Seminary. Quote, we're seeing an openness to the transcendence among young people that we haven't seen for some time. Now, as you read through the quotes from various people, you're you realize quickly that this is not like what we would recognize as Orthodox Christianity. These people are not reading City of God and Martin Luther and John Calvin and all the early church reformers and everything else. They are trying to figure things out. And there's a hunger there the same way that there was a hunger 2,000 years ago in this city that Paul and Barnabas wandered into. And what I want to do is examine this question of how do we respond to this? How do we look at this? And I want to make sure that we understand this and understand the issues and the world that we're working in. This, friends, is a profoundly anxious age. This is a world where everybody is very on edge. And in the same way that people were 2,000 years ago, in the same way that these people in the city were on edge about their futures, on edge about plagues and famines and everything else, today we sit in this world where we are all on edge and terrified and frustrated and just always feel like we're one step away from disaster. And there's various causes. You can make a case for social media, for cable news, for all these things. You can make a strong case for institutional breakdown, whether that's the church, the family, the lack of trust in government. Take your pick. It is an overdetermined phenomenon. And I'm not standing up here to tell you how bad things are. I have no interest in that. My response is, how do we live in this world. And let me tell you, one of the things that I have really changed on in the last couple of months. You see, when if you know me, you know I have a low tolerance for complaining. I just do. Okay? It's one of my, I don't know if that's a plus or a minus, but just one of the things to know me, I have a low tolerance for people being grumpy and cranky. And occasionally I would get this not occasionally, on a regular basis. I get this, pastor, things have never been this bad. And I want to roll my eyes so bad they're going to sprain whenever I hear that, okay? And whenever I hear something like, things have never been this bad in America, things have never been this bad for Christians, especially when I hear this never been this bad for Christians, 
I just want to start pulling out the history books and go on for days on, okay, let's start with Emperor Trajan and then just work our way through all the persecutions that Christians have suffered. But somebody pointed out to me recently that you can't reason somebody out of a position they did not reason themselves into. And that, I've been wrestling with that. Let me just repeat that again. You can't reason somebody out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. Yeah, it's something you think about. And what's going on is we arrive at that position, that frustration, because of all the anxiety and everything else. It's not like we've made a detailed study of history and said, why, yes, we are worse than the persecutions of this, this, and this, but better than these, these, and these. It's we see things breaking down, and we're frustrated, and we're anxious. And so here's what I want to say. How do we live in this world? Let me go here. Let me go back 2,700 years ago. Katie, if you'd put up Hezekiah, please. There is this really interesting story 2,700 years ago. And there's a king by the name of Hezekiah. And the way I love this is this Hezekiah held fast to the Lord. And he trusted in God. And he hung on to what God had called him to be. And you're thinking, well, that's good. He's a king of Israel. He had a lot of things to trust. Like, <laughs> no. Okay. Hezekiah, during this time, Israel was this tiny little city-state, and they were caught between two giant empires. And Hezekiah was literally surrounded by the Assyrian uh, army. And I mean literally in the literal sense. They were laying siege to, to Jerusalem. And so Hezekiah, encouraged by Isaiah and others, he's like, we're going to hang fast to what God calls us to be. And if there was a guy who ever could have made a legitimate case for selling out and saying, no, I'm, I'm just going to go with what seems normal here because I don't have any other options, it was Hezekiah. And what's really amazing is when we go to Israel in the fall, we're having a trip if you want to come with, you can still see some of the stuff that Hezekiah did because he wanted to hang fast to God. And it's our challenge is to encourage each other to respond in love, not respond out of anger, but to say, okay, we're going to trust and be part of what God has called us to be. And part of the way we do that is remembering the way that God has been with us in the past. Now, there's a rather really interesting point that comes along a couple hundred years after Hezekiah. Katie, if you want to throw up the Micah verse, please. Again, Old Testament history. The prophet Micah asks this question, or God gives him this word, of how are we supposed to live? And I love what it says this. What does God require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Friends, this is who we're called to be. This is an anxious, frustrated, scary world. And it's not a young versus old. It's not a rural versus city. It's not a red versus uh, blue. It's not a rich versus poor. It permeates across every class and political structure in our society. And this is how we're called to respond. And you think, well, yeah, but do you know what they're doing to us? Do you know what they're doing? Yeah, I do. And I want you to think about the history. There was a sign, a political sign, that I saw, and I'm not going to tell you who put it up or which way it favored because I'm not getting in red versus blue. This is an American society issue. And the sign said, if this person wins... Our lives don't matter. And I wanted to go over there and just spray. I drove by it on a regular basis, and it drove me nuts. And I'd see it every time. And finally, I, I was like, what I want to do is I want to go over there. And don't worry, I didn't do this, but I wanted to. I wanted to write on there, 
your lives always matter to God. Because we get so wrapped up in these little things. We get so wrapped up in what's happening here. And we think, this is the end. But this is how we're called to respond. And you think, yeah, but do you know what they're doing to us? Yeah, I do. And I want you to think about the first 300 years of the church. From the time Jesus ascends into heaven to when Christianity becomes legal in the Roman Empire, how did they respond? They responded this way. Acting justly, walking humbly, loving God, loving their neighbor. And it's this way that Christianity spread. You cannot show me one point in time in the early church where it's like, oh yeah, they were getting persecuted, so they raised up arms and fought back. When Jesus himself is persecuted by Pilate, when Jesus is sitting there, and Pilate's like, yeah, I have the power of life and death over you. And Jesus responds, no, I'm here in my own free will. I have legions of angels at my command. And he says, I am doing this to save humanity. Friends, I want you to understand and think about this. That when we go back to that article I read you earlier, they're not looking for people to win battles in social media. They're not looking for people to, to fight. They're looking for people to love. Looking for people to say, this is who my God is. This is what I have for you. I want to give you one last thought, one last example. And this comes back from our early church example. And just to show you how we love people into the kingdom. In the year 320, there was another persecution of Christians in the Eastern Roman Empire. And the way it worked in those days was not they would come to you like the secret police and knock on your door and raid your house to see if you had Bibles in there. They would just say, are you a Christian? And if you said no, they would say, okay, fine, let's go down to the temple. You make a sacrifice to our gods. Then you're not a Christian, no harm, no foul. But if you say you're a Christian, then we torture you till you recant or you die. It just just the way it is. Now, the Romans, for all their faults, they didn't torture people just to torture people. They always did it with a purpose. And so there was a persecution that rolled through, and there was 40 soldiers from this legion in what today is Armenia. And the governor said, okay, guys, we're going to put you out in this frozen lake, and we're going to have warm baths over here for you, and food, and all you got to do is recant Jesus. And they said, okay, we'll sit out in this frozen lake. And after three days and three nights, they endured. And then one young soldier decided to leave the group for the warmth of the bass, but the shock to his system killed him. One of the guards, seeing this disgrace, was inspired by the resolve of the remaining 39. When he was off duty, he fell asleep by the fire and had a dream which the angels descended upon the soldiers on the lake and crowned them. He counted only 39 crowns and decided to join them. He put down his arms and his cloak, proclaimed himself a Christian, and walked out to the group in the ice, bringing the number of martyrs back up to 40. And friends, I share that with you because I want you to ponder this, to think about how are we called to share the love of this Christ in our world, not by fighting, but by loving and serving and walking humbly with our God. I want you to ask, what's your witness? Because powered by the Holy Spirit, we can be just as loving and as kind and as humble as the early church was. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Spirit. Give us your wisdom and grace. Help us to walk humbly and love all those that you've put in our path, that we could be your witness here and to the ends of the earth. Amen.